Hi, everybody out there. Thanks for being with us tonight for our virtual in our virtual format and tuning into our live lecture or our live webinar lecture. I am Jill Miranda Baker, the executive director of Keys History and Discovery Center. Our program producer, Erin Muir, also known as our membership and events manager, is joining in from her office down the way. We are pleased to offer you a June virtual lecture and honored by your continued interest and support. Today, we held a soft opening for our members. We re officially reopened the museum doors on Wednesday, June 17th, returning to our normal Wednesdays through Sundays, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Our reliance on volunteers is to, serve our do to serve as docents and greeters to guests is greater than ever. Many of our regulars are back at their homes, summer homes, and for others, it is unsafe to unnecessarily be around the general public. If it is safe for you and you are able, please consider volunteering. We have shifts available Wednesday through Sundays, 10 to 1.30 and 1.30 to 5. If you want to learn more about it, give us a call or submit a volunteer interest form through our website at keysdiscovery.com. Once we reopen, our virtual programs will continue with some modifications. The virtual visits on Tuesday will continue at 10 a.m. Tomorrow will be our last Thursday virtual visit. Field trip Fridays will also continue at 10 a.m. on Facebook, and moat visits will happen on the first Monday of each month at 1 p.m. Our next program on Wednesday, June 17th is Cocktails with a Curator, and that's an open Q&A video session with Brad, and these will continue into July on the third Wednesday of the month at five. The program does have limited capacity, so make sure you register in advance at www.keysdiscovery.com virtual programs. And then on Wednesday, 20, June 24th at five, we would love to have you join us for Community Views, a narrated pictorial presentation sharing videos of early days in the Upper Keys community. Rock Harbor will be explored on June 24th. Our next virtual lecture is set for Wednesday, July 8th at six. Where, where Brad Bertelli will be presenting The Legends of Black Caesar, Three Stories, One Pirate. You can register on our website at the virtual programs. Now for some go-to webinar housekeeping items. You should all see the go-to webinar viewer, which contains both the presentation slides and the webcam view. If you were on a computer, this is to the left of your screen. If you are viewing on an iPhone, you will need to swipe left and right to switch between the presentation and the presenter. On your computer, the control panel is located to the right. If your control panel collapses, the orange arrow allows you to expand it again. On a tablet or phone, the control features are at the top or top and bottom. If you have a technical question for Aaron or myself, you can type that into the questions panel during the presentation. So let's do a test run right now. Erin is going to ask a question, so please reply to her with the number of people, including yourself, watching tonight. If you have a question for Ryan, we ask that you hold those until the question and answer segment at the end. We will review the raise your hand feature at the start of the Q&A segment. If you experience a decrease in bandwidth during the lecture, you can choose to watch just the webcam view or just the slide presentation view. Audio will continue with either screen. Now I'm happy to introduce our speaker. Ryan Hark is a registered professional archeologist and PhD candidate in anthropology at the University of South Florida in Tampa. He has worked in private sector archeology span intermittently over the past 12 years and he was a public archeologist at Flagler College in St. Augustine. Ryan has spent the last five years researching the archeology span of the Florida Keys for his doctoral degree. Welcome, Ryan from Tampa. Thank you. First off, thank you so much to Jill, to Brad, to Aaron, to everyone involved for hosting me here tonight. I'm really, really happy to be here talking about my research. Thanks to the audience and everyone that's present amid the times and everything that we're we're experiencing right now. So it's great that even in this format that we're all able to get together and and do something fun. So without 
too, too much, let's, oh, I don't want to let me advance the slide. Oh, there it goes. All right, so I was gonna say, let's jump into the presentation. So before we talk about the Florida Keys and the Stock Island site in particular, let's dial back a bit and talk about islands writ large or islands across the globe and why it is and what archeologists think about people moving or relocating to islands in the first place. Usually we conceptualize these as push or pull factors in terms of why humans, a landbound, a terrestrial species, would ever be interested in getting into a boat and traveling tens or hundreds or even perhaps thousands of miles to reach a remote landmass. Sometimes this is going to happen on accident by drifting with a current or with winds or with a storm, or sometimes this is going to be very, very care carefully planned. And that's the only way that a group of folks might be able to reach a, a particular island is because it's thousands of miles away. And um, this is gonna require intensive planning. Now, as I said, these push-pull factors, a push or an example of pushing a population or a group of people to an island might be that an invading group came to the mainland or to the coast where they where they were once living and they forced them out they they won a battle or a war or for any other social reason they decided that it was best to relocate or go somewhere else and perhaps this could have even happened within a society. Maybe a group of outcasts for some social or political reason were requested to leave. And so they embarked to travel to a new area because they had no other choice. An example of a pull factor might be that some other folks in your population or in your group or culture have found a resource due to or from explorations of a particular area. And maybe it's raw stone, raw stone for tool making. Maybe it's rich fish or turtle resources, subsistence resources that people can eat when you're running out of local resources in the place that you currently live. So that might be an example of a pull factor, something that's gonna draw you away from where it is that you're living. And then of course, there's no getting away from just the actual human spirit, the, curiosity that we have as the human species of wanting wanting to know what's around the next bend, what's around the next corner. And so there's definitely something to be said for that. And in cases like the Florida Keys, where the islands aren't, relatively speaking, they're not very far from the mainland. And so exploration, of course, would have played a big part in how, in how the Florida Keys were colonized. And we're gonna talk about that more throughout the, the remainder of the presentation. All right, so what do you need to get across to various islands? This is going to vary greatly dependent upon whether you're in a river, a bay, a sea, or, or an ocean. Your, your first order thing is going to be stable watercraft, a boat of some kind, and then after that, you're gonna need some locomotion to, to get you to your next island or your next target of where it is that you want to go. And in most cases in Aboriginal societies across the globe, your only two means of locomotion were going to be the sail or have a team of rowers. And in the case of the New World in North and South America, we do not have hard evidence of sail technology being used prior to the arrival of Europeans to the New World prior to the arrival of the Spaniards, British, French, and Portuguese, and so on, we don't have concrete evidence. It doesn't mean that no one in Native America had the sale, it's just we, we don't have archeological evidence of it. Now this is very different from a scenario like the South Pacific, where there is heavy documentation, both historically and archeologically, of sail technology, which would have been required to reach islands that were thousands of miles apart from one another. And that's very different from a situation in the Caribbean where almost every single island is intervisible. And by that, I simply mean you can, no matter which island you're standing on, 
on a clear day, you for the most part have the ability to see the next island, which again is a very different scenario from other island regions of the world. And so these are all factors that are going to play into island colonization and the decisions that humans are making because it's, it's also wrapped up into what the ultimate goal is. Is it exploration or is it colonization, which can be very, very different for the groups in terms of what it is that they're packing. Do you need a sustainable population of of people to keep to keep the population going? How much fresh water do you need to bring? How much food? How much do you know about the land that you're targeting? And so these are all variables that need to be considered uh, for the humans that are making these journeys. And these are all things that we take into account as archaeologists in trying to assess what these people's lives were like, which is you know one of the ultimate goals of anthropology and archaeology. And now, of course, there are a lot of pros and cons to island living. People in the Keys and people in island areas across the globe can, can attest to this. The first thing to consider is, first and foremost, what is the size of the island that you're living on? On an island the size of, for example, New Guinea, which is well over or a couple thousand square kilometers, for the native people that would have been living there, Ethnographically, we know some of them never saw the coast before they died or they were shocked when they finally did. So it actually didn't feel like an island. Now, if you contrast that with an incredibly small island, something the size of one of the Florida Keys, for example, it's going to have a very, very different feel. And it's also going to have a very different outcome with the resources that are available to you as a native islander. In a large island, for example, Cuba, you're going to have running fresh water. You're maybe not even going to come into contact with some of your neighbors that live on that same island. You might have a large array of terrestrial land animals and resources that are spread evenly or maybe distributed patchily across your island. Whereas in a very, very small island, and again, I'll go back to the example of the Florida Keys, you may not have hardly any terrestrial animals at all, um, save for a few small ground rodents, and you might be entirely reliant upon the sea. And so very, very different situations depending on where your island is, what the size of it is, and, and even what the topography. Now, a mountainous island is gonna be very different from a flat one in terms of when a tropical cyclone shows up and creates a very high storm surge. For example, that's going to have very different consequences for a native population than a group of folks who can go into the mountains and stay high and dry during a storm event or whatever it is that's happening. The, the last comment I'll make about pros and cons of island living, and of course there are many more than what I'm, what I'm talking about now, but another one that we can relate to now is disease. And now the novel coronavirus, which is spreading COVID-19, in the case of an island, it's a good thing or a pro to be on an island if you're able to stay isolated and keep anyone from entering the island that has that disease and then spreading it to, to all of the others. So isolation can be good, but if one person gets in and is able to spread it across the community, then it can wipe out an entire island or nearly an entire island in short order in a way that wouldn't be possible perhaps on a continent or a mainland or somewhere that was more sparsely populated than a tiny area. And so those are just some of the pros and cons of, of island living that archeologists consider. And I'm gonna run through these really, really quick, just a couple basics of, of how we look at colonization across the globe and just how different it can be in different areas depending upon all those factors that I was talking about earlier with regard to your technology and your knowledge base about ocean going travel and different factors like this. So we see in the South Pacific, for example, Australia, New Zealand, and all these areas between Southeast Asia, a lot of these islands were colonized very, very early on in human history. Um, we know that Australia was populated about 60,000 years ago, and then shortly thereafter, around 30, 
thousand years ago, give or take, some of the larger islands, the Faroe Islands that are nearer to Australia were colonized very early. And then in much later time, the remote areas of Polynesia, Micronesia, Melanesia were, were not colonized almost until Europeans got there with, with large galleons and ships. So islands such as uh, the Hawaiian archipelago, Easter Island, these places were only colonized by Aboriginal people on the order of maybe perhaps a couple centuries prior to European or Asian arrival there. And so there's a wide array that occurs in, in some areas of the globe. In a different area like the Mediterranean basin, which is a, is a large sea, but we could almost conceive of it as a large bay, was populated, uh, the islands there could have been populated 10,000 or more years ago because there's a long human history of occupation there. People were living in Africa for hundreds of thousands of years, and then the circum-Mediterranean area of the Middle East, Eastern and Western Europe, these areas had been populated for so many thousands of years, and many of the nearest islands in the Mediterranean were visible from those land masses. And so it's not surprising that some of these islands were colonized around the time of the Neolithic 10,000 years ago um, with the onset of agriculture in that area of the world. And now you can contrast that with the Caribbean a bit. Um, folks have been living in the New World for as far as we know, 15,000 years or so. And the Caribbean islands are thought to have been populated by folks from South and Central America. And now they colonized the first areas of the Caribbean um, off the Northeast coast of South America, Trinidad and Tobago. That was a hop, skip and a jump, easy, easy to get to from the mainland. But then you have more remote islands of the Caribbean that whether people knew about them, they didn't colonize them until much later in time. The Bahamas, for example, the Bahama Archipelago, people aren't known to have arrived there until AD 600, AD 700, so about 1300 years ago, much, much later in time. And we see a similar situation in Africa, where, I mean, which is an absolutely massive continent, as we know. But the islands that were nearby were colonized thousands of years ago. And However, the islands that were much farther away or even a little ways distance from the coast, a, a big glaring example is Madagascar, wasn't colonized until much later in time. And it in fact wasn't, from, wasn't by people from Africa. We think that the first people to Madagascar along the southeast coast of Africa was, were colonized by people from the sub-Indian continent for the first time. And so the major takeaway here is that Island colonization is very, very regional and it's specific um, to the geography, it's specific to the cultures, it's specific to the, the, the climate and the topography of the area. And so there's no one size fits all for the most part um, when it comes to conceiving of islands. And then now when we distill it down to our Florida Keys, we see at the bottom of the page there, perhaps about 3000 BP. BP, if I, hadn't mentioned. Um, it, it just means years before present. So you can think of it in terms of years ago. So I hope that wasn't too much of a distraction. But the, the Florida Keys 3,000 years ago is about an, an estimate. We know that people lived in mainland Florida for a much longer time than that. And honestly, 10,000 years ago, the Florida Keys would not have been islands at all. They would have been part of the Florida platform and would have been dry land. And now all those sites are, are drowned by sea level rise and we'll never, well, I shouldn't say we'll never, um, we haven't been able to find any yet, but um, they, they may still be out there. But at any rate, we're still working to discover or to find out when the Florida Keys were first occupied or the evidence that we can find of the, the first occupation. All right, here's a picture of the Florida Keys Archipelago for those of you who are unfamiliar. I know many in this room are very, very familiar and some people might be seeing it for the first time. By some definitions and some measures, the, the Florida Keys might not be considered islands at all because like I was saying just a moment ago, because they're seated on top of the Florida platform and they're only exposed lines, limestone, coral outcroppings, uh, above the sea, 
it's not considered geologically an island in the same way that a volcanic island is where it's the result of cumulative underwater volcanoes creating an island landmass such as the case in the Lesser Antilles in the Caribbean, the Hawaiian Islands, and others in the in the South Pacific. So they're different in that way. Um, another way that they're different is is that they're very very low above sea level, and they're obviously close to the continent, which I mentioned earlier. Um, but in the in the case of the Florida Keys, they're not as far away as they could be. Another example of a mainland island or continental island is what is what we would call the Florida Keys is actually Barbados in the Caribbean. So if anybody has their browser up um, and want to pull up Barbados, it's on the eastern or the southeastern Caribbean on the east side of the Lesser Antilles, but it's actually part of the, of the South American mainland. And it's just a very, very far outcropping. And so those are all different kinds of, of islands geographically and geologically speaking. All right. So what's interesting about these mainland and these continental islands is that they receive most of their flora, their, their plants and their animals from the mainland, from their uh, continental home. And so in the case of the Florida Keys, all of the terrestrial animals for the most part, your deer, your black bear, your raccoons, possums, things like this, they all filtered down from the Florida Peninsula at times of lower water or they were animals that had the ability to raft or to swim. Now the aquatic life came the opposite direction from the Caribbean, right? We have a large tropical reef in the Florida Keys, and so we have lots of West Indian or Caribbean fish and sea turtle species and so forth. And so that's very common, and um, it's, it's, there are similar situations to that elsewhere across the globe, where a lot of the terrestrial species made it there because they were simply so close to the mainland. And the same is true of humans. And so that's what we know for the Florida Keys. And that's what I'm gonna talk about here in just a moment with the Native Americans in South Florida. We don't have in prehistory any evidence that Aboriginal populations prior to contact with the old world um, ever came from the West Indies, the Caribbean or Central America. All of the artifacts, the archeological evidence that we have, and even about 99% of the written testimony from folks from the old world suggests that the people came down from mainland Florida. And now what's also interesting about people that live in South Florida is despite the agricultural revolutions that were happening in the Southeastern United States, even as far south as the Flor Florida Panhandle and maybe a bit farther south, is these peoples never practiced large scale agriculture of any kind. By comparison, by around AD 1000 or shortly thereafter in the Southeast and Midwestern United States, people were practicing corn agriculture, squash, beans, other, other forms, other uh, popular crops to a very large degree. And in South Florida, south of Lake Okeechobee, and I'll, I'll show a graphic here in a moment, as far as we know, people never practiced this kind of agriculture. They relied entirely upon the estuaries, the rivers, the fresh water bodies, and the sea and the seas and oceans um, for their livelihood. Now, one could make an argument that they essentially were farming fish, and I wouldn't disagree with that. And so it was the bountiful harvest from the bay, seas, and oceans that allowed South Florida natives to practice a subsistence form that didn't really exist to that extent or didn't exist in totality for other peoples who were relying on agriculture in, in other places of the U.S. at the same time. And to be clear, the South Florida natives were aware that other folks were doing things differently, but they, they really, it was part of their culture. It was part of their milieu, I think, and they chose to continue this subsistence pattern and, and this life way in spite of new knowledge. And I'll, and I'll talk about that more in a moment. Okay, now I was talking about South Florida 
as a whole earlier, but there's also a few exceptions and a few rare or unique things about the Keys specifically. Now it's true that in South Florida, one of the dearths is stone tools. A lot of your tool manufacture that's occurring in Florida and elsewhere, maybe Florida less than other states, is from a vein of limestone, flint or chert. This is what your arrowheads, your spear points and items like this are all made out of. And it's what we associate with Native Americans across the entire Southeast US. But as you move farther south down the Florida Peninsula, this resource becomes scarcer and scarcer. Some of the nearest outcroppings to South Florida proper are the Hillsborough River in Tampa and the Peace River um, a little bit in Southwest Florida, a little bit closer to Venice area. And so not really that close to the Everglades and not that close to the Keys. And so we do see traded, uh, traded in items down there, but not, not in a way you would see in a more inland area where these materials are more abundant. What we do see is pumice, which is from the Caribbean largely, and shows up because it can float in. And so it's very light, it's raftable, it can catch palm fronds and other materials, and it doesn't always even need to. And so we find this at Native American sites in the Keys. Also, we find in some instances, some limestone or some similar materials that were made into grinding tools. Depending on when they date, they could in in post-contact times after Europeans, they could date to, or pardon me, they could come from the Caribbean. Um, prior to that time, it's thought that they would have probably come from the Appalachian Mountains. They would have come from somewhere in Georgia or farther north, or maybe even farther afield. But these items have made their way down to the Keys, albeit in, in small numbers. So what, what took the place of stone was shell tools and um, shell, shell tool manufacture. It was the hardest, most abundant material that could be used. These are the three principal species that we find in the Florida Keys um, that were turned into handheld tools. We see an, an image there courtesy of Bill Marquardt who studied the Calusa in Southwest Florida for well over 30 years. Um, but it shows an example of a lightning whelk, that shell on the top left side being converted into an ax or into a hammer, which could be used to fell trees and hollow out canoes and all sorts of other things. The, the number one shell used in the Florida Keys was the bottom left shell, that bright pink one called the Queen Conch. And it was used, or I should say all of these were used both as food and as tools. And this was important in the Keys, especially because it's the only area or one of the very few coastal or island areas in Florida where oysters do not live and oysters do not thrive because it's mostly open marine or very high saline waters. Everywhere else in Florida on the coast, for the most part, not everywhere, oysters and oyster reefs are widely available. And so that was very important for Native Americans, both in terms of food and, term, and in terms of mound construction. Along the west and east coast of Florida, there's places where almost entire islands were built out of oysters. And so there was an absence of that in the Florida Keys. And so when we see mounds or trash middens of their refuse, we see typically piled up queen conchs and in, in the Keys, chunks of limestone, because that was, that was what was locally available in place of oysters and some clams and things that were more widespread in other areas of Florida. Okay. This is the slide that I was alluding to a moment ago when I was talking about South Florida. And now the political and social boundaries of, of South Florida have changed over time, obviously, and into the modern age. But when I talk about the Native Americans that live there between about, you'll see at the very bottom right of your screen, between about 500 BC and AD 1760, we refer to all of these people as part of the Glades tradition. And that area on the map in the brown is what we refer to as the Glades culture area. And so when I say Glades for the rem remainder of this presentation, all at once, it's referring to a group of people, a group of interrelated cultures, it's relating to geography, 
and it's relating to certain toolkits, the ones that um, I just showed you a moment ago. I'm gonna show some, some slides in just a moment that elaborate on that. And perhaps most importantly, it refers to a common ceramic tradition or uh, ceramic styles that exist in South Florida. Not exclusively in South Florida, but it's the area where they're most densely found. And I should also add that in the very rare events where we have found human remains in South Florida, and there's been genetic test testing and DNA testing, um, it's, it's shown that these people are biologically interrelated as well. And so this is a group of related folks over a, an overlapping time period that shared a wider culture, shared tools, shared a spirituality and uh, religious practices and so on. So when, when I refer to the Glades tradition, I'm, I'm really talking about all of that meshed into one. Okay, so let's take an example or, or take a look at some examples of, of some of these ceramics. And I've put their names on the slide next to their image. And then I've also put the years that are associated with that ceramic styles production. So if we look at the surfside incised on the top left, we see those nice grooved lines. That's actually, if you were to reach over that with, with your left hand, that's actually a little appendage on the rim of the pot. And so that would have been used for holding. And so this style, surfside incised, as you see, was made for about 200 years, from AD 1200 to 1400. And so when you find ceramics similar to that in style, you can be sure that it dates to somewhere in that ballpark. And the same goes with that Key Largo incised style that we see on the top right, where it has those nice two arches there around the rim of the shirt. And that dates to a longer stretch of time, admittedly, but it's still a marker of time. And then we see on the bottom lots of examples of, of glades tooled, which is another ceramic type that comes in various forms. Some are thought to be a little bit older, older than others, but it wasn't made until AD 1400, so about 100 years before the Europeans arrived. And so when you find these, it's a time marker, and it's a marker of what was culturally happening at, the, at that time in Florida. And so these are just three examples of dozens um, that we find at archeological sites in South Florida that seem to unify the people in terms of a ceramic tradition. So this would have been something that people were teaching to each other generation after generation as a marker of tribe, as a marker of culture, as a marker of, of something. We're not, we're not entirely sure. There's something that bound these people together and perhaps these motifs mean something spiritually, perhaps they're functional, but whatever it is they mean, we know they're bound together in some way. The same goes um, perhaps to a lesser extent, but maybe not with a lot of the tools that we find in the area. I mentioned all of those shell tools and here are just some examples. These are actually from the Stock Island Midden um, itself, but items like these can be found across South Florida. We see the highest density of drilled shark's teeth anywhere in Florida, in South Florida, as far as I'm aware. Um, we have examples there on the top left of a lemon shark tooth and some tiger shark teeth. We don't know precisely all of the time what these were used for. Um, in some cases, they were probably attached to necklaces and could be simple adornment. Others we know were used as knives and as cutting implements, just obviously because they were so sharp. We see a few other tools here. I showed you the queen conch a moment ago, the pink shell for which the keys have gotten one of, one of their names, the conch republic, that queen conch cell uh, on the bottom left that could have been used as a pounder or a smasher of some kind. Um, the lightning whelk, the other shell that I showed in the image earlier that was used as a chopper or as, a, as an ax or hammer, you can see the hole in that shell, that's where the where the wooden stick or implement would have been would have been inserted so that it could be used as a handheld tool. 
Um, on the right, we see another example of a more complete queen conch where it simply has a rectangle cut out of it. Um, clearly, they wanted to use that uh, material for something. Again, it could have been for adornment. Um, it could have been for any number of uses. But these are the kinds of refuse uh, that, that we sometimes find at sites in the Keys. Okay, so panning out a little bit from the the tools that we see in the keys and the ceramic styles, we can look at some of the archeological sites. Now, all these red dots that you see on the image here on the map are some of these significant sites that have been located in the Florida Keys. And, and I'll begin by saying that 95% of these no longer exist or, excuse me, they only exist in very, very remnant form, due, largely due to development. There's not much land in the Keys to begin with, as many are aware. And when you couple in lots and lots of development and tropical storms and other factors like these, then it, it doesn't bode well for archaeological sites. But these were some of the larger ones that are known. A lot of these... Um, were documented as early as the 1930s and 40s when people started to do formal archaeological excavation throughout the archipelago. Um, and as I said, most of them unfortunately no longer exist. And that's true with the Stock Island site. I'm going to talk more about that in the moment. So you can see um, where that's located all the way at the bottom there near, near Key West. Just in terms of time, maybe if we have a little bit more time in the q and A, I I can talk about some of these sites individually um, if people have questions, but I think just based on our timing, I'm just going to move along and talk about the sites as a whole. All right, so one question that I, I get fairly often is how large were the native habitations? And, uh, and again, unfortunately, the the short answer is we're not entirely sure. And that's for a number of reasons that I had begun to outline. We can document some of the, the largest sites that were once in existence or were once viewed by people. We know from historical records of the first Europeans and Euro-Americans to come to the Keys, they wrote that some of the shell mounds, particularly on Key West, were up to 10 feet tall, piled with the queen conch shells that I mentioned and limestone. And we know of some sites on Key Largo, the Key Largo Rock Mound, where the Calusa campground is today, um, that was definitely similar to that in size. But as I mentioned, development and, and other impacts have eroded or entire, entirely eliminated these sites over the years. Um, middens, the trash piles, that's the most common site that was once found in the Keys, which would have just been an amalgamation of shell and rich black organic soil and, and pottery sherds and, and faunal bone, all the remnants, all the trash of things that, that people threw away. And now there's, there's a range of sizes for these from just a couple scattered shells to football field sized um, football field sized or larger uh, midden deposits that were anywhere from three to six feet deep and so there's a there's a wide variety that's out there and as I mentioned, some of these sites and many of these sites were probably even bigger than than what we documented and and we won't ever entirely know what they would have looked like at their peak time of construction just because of, of all of the factors and all of the um, all the things that harm the sites over the years. And so um, we can talk about that more in the Q&A too if, if people are curious because it it is a really interesting topic and one that we're still trying to learn about. But at, at any rate, everything was everything was going quite well um, for the Native Americans up to a certain point, and and that's when folks from the old world began to arrive. 
and I just have Columbus's three ships pictured here um, that landed in the Bahamas on the island of what we now refer to as San Salvador. The Taino would have known it as Guanahani. But at, at that time in 1492, it really set the wheels into motion of massive cultural change. Um, and to, to really put that lightly, the Spanish began to rapidly both murder and enslave Native American populations across the Caribbean. And it, and it wouldn't be long at all before news of this would reach, would reach South Florida and our Florida Keys in particular. And so by, by about 1511, the, the Spanish were pressing into Cuba's interior and they were searching for runaway Taino slaves from the, from the Caribbean, from other islands on uh, such as Hispaniola and the Bahamas and, and so on. And so this actually pushed people up into Florida. So by the time people were pressing into Cuba, people were already on boats headed for the Keys in South Florida. And so by the time Juan Ponce de Leon, the quote unquote sort of discoverer of, of Florida, at least formally and with heavy documentation, in 1513, as he entered the Calusa capital in Southwest Florida in the Charlotte Harbor area, the Calusa sent out the Calusa sent out a, a Caribbean a Caribbean native already um, as a stall tactic um, to to deflect while they actually began to attack the Spanish. And so, um, pardon me. Okay, I'm running low on time. All right, so I'm going to speed this up. And so the point is that the South Florida natives were, were very well aware of the, the Spanish presence. And then Pedro Menendez de Aviles of fame of founding, founding of St. Augustine and becoming governor there. He also recorded lots of towns in, in South Florida and in the Keys. Um, but our two bigger names in Florida Keys ethno history are, of course, Escalante Fontaneda and Lopez de Velasco, who, who spoke at length um, in the written record about Florida Keys with respect to their prowess at, at fishing and spearing fish, at the types of clothes that they wore, woven um, palm fronds and, and Spanish moss, that in fact the archeological evidence was accurate that they only recorded them eating things from the sea. And most importantly, they began to record their politics of what was happening at the time, who their leaders were, who the important culture or chiefdoms were, and where their towns were. And that was actually very, very big. And now I apologize, I'm seeing I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna try to, try to move quick here. Um, and so here is a model of three towns in the Keys that we've arrived at based on information from Lopez de Velasco and Escalante Fontaneda. And we had documentation on uh, or for several of these towns, which again, hopefully I can go over in Q&A if people are interested, but the important one is at the bottom left there, which is Cuchiaga. And that one is related to our Stock Island site. And we're gonna zoom in here in a moment. And fast forward to a map drawn in Key West in 1775. This red dot here is the location of the Stock Island site as we know it and a hypothetical location of perhaps where Cuchiaga was once located. I think that Stock Island was actually a midden of the larger town, which would have been lo located on Old Town Key West. And maybe we can talk about that in a moment, but I'm gonna keep moving forward here in time. This map was drafted by the US Coastal Survey or the equivalent of the USGS in 1850 to 55, depending on which variable you wanna look at. That red dot there, that is the Stock Island Midden. Um, it's on a little outlying island in, in between Key West and Stock Island. And so I think that's actually ultimately what afforded it some level of preservation was it was away from the larger development of the big island, uh, relatively big island of Key West. Now, this is fast forwarding again, 1959, um, to a high resolution aerial. This is Stock Island on your right the northeast tip of Key West on your left. And then above, we see that little outlying island again and a little open area. 
And I think that's where the midden, or at least part of the midden, was once located at the site. And just for frame of reference, here's a modern landscape of Key West, Stock Island, our two channels there, Cow Key and Boca Chica, and the present location of the site, which is now the Monroe County Jail, unfortunately. We don't need to look at all of this here. All of these, these are all representative of radiocarbon dates. I just want folks to see the very bottom that our radiocarbon dates show occupation at the site between AD 600 and about AD 1650. So we're showing a thousand years of intermittent occupation at the site. I've got a graph here of how I think the island was first settled. If we follow our yellow areas here, it's only 25 miles in between present day Flamingo and Baca Key, which is the east side of present day Marathon. And based on similarities in pottery style, um, I think that this could have been a possible source population for the people who are depositing the Stock Island Midden. Again, hopefully we have time to talk about that more in the future. And so what this leads us to is how complex were societies in the Keys prior to contact, prior to 1492 and Spanish Old World invaders, and were people living in the Keys seasonally or year round? Was Stock Island the um, leftovers of a fish of concurrent or seasonal and um, successive fishing trips, or was it a permanent year round habitation site? And that's one of the questions we're trying to answer. I know I'm running very low on time. I'm gonna try to really wrap this up. The way that we're answering this question of seasonal or year-round habitation is we're collecting clamshells and we're doing a process that is very, very similar to dendrochronology or tree ring dating. If we look to the left of the graph and um, trace the line, this line is temperature that we're obtaining from the chemical content of the shell. And so if you follow the, the line left to right, you see it goes through annual cycles of summer and winter or wet and hot and dry and mild. And so by the end of the shell's life, which you see at the very far right of the graph, um, we can see that this shell died during the winter time. And if we apply this method to all the clamshells in our Stock Island site, what we're going to get is a signal of whether these, shell, these shells were being collected either in the warm season or during the cool season. And so that's, that's what we're hoping to do to determine the seasonality of the Stock Island site. And we're working on that over this summer and into the fall. Our future research is we're gonna analyze more shells. We're gonna get more radiocarbon dates that we don't expect the time frame to change and eventually do other analyses on pollen and charcoal and um, other forms of pottery and hopefully we'll get the chance to actually excavate in the city of Key West under some of those private residences. Our two major public outcomes that we're aiming for are to get an artifact display, um, an exhibit in the Key West Custom House which is part of their Art and Historical Society and then we want to get a historical marker on Key West for the site which instead which we would call the Stock Island Archaeological Site. So it looks something like this. Okay, with that, um, I'll thank you and open it up to questions. And I'm so sorry that I rambled in the beginning that um, I had to rush through that at the end. But thank you. All right, so guys, we're gonna um, just give us a moment to switch our screens back over here. You've got, okay, great. You've got my screen now. And I guess you're probably also wondering who's talking. So um, this is Aaron Muir and I'm going to be uh, facilitating the question and answer portion. So if you all would like to ask a question, I'll review the raise hand feature. So if you would like to ask a question, you can hit your raise hand button. And then I'll be able to see everyone who has a hand raised and will call on you to ask your question. When I call on you, I will unmute your microphone and you should get a notification that says the organizer has unmuted you. Would you like to unmute? And you select yes. If you don't see this notification, you can always check your mute status by looking at your microphone button. If there is a flash line through it, you are muted. 
or if it's red, and if there's no slash or green, then your mic is on for everyone to hear. If someone else asks your question, or you, or you change your mind about asking your question, hit your raise hand button again, and it will lower your virtual hand. Or you can always type in your question in the questions panel like we reviewed at the start of the webinar, and I will read your question to Ryan. So let me take a look at our, see if we have any hands raised to start. We did have a couple of questions coming in um, that were typed, but Suzanne has a hand raised. So Suzanne, I have unmuted you and you can go ahead and ask your question. Hey Ryan, thanks for the presentation. Um, I was just curious if you guys have ascertained whether or not those inhabitants were Calusa or something else. All right. Um, we we don't know for certain. What we can what we can probably say is it it depends on the time period. And I'm sorry I didn't get the chance to mention this, but we didn't get the name Calusa until the Spanish arrived and and labeled them as such. And if the Native Americans known as the Calusa and some of these and some of these other groups um, followed a pattern in prehistoric times similar to what they were doing during the Spanish period, it, it traced the name of the head chief. And so if you were to go back 100 years or 200 years prior to the Calusa, for example, the Calusa themselves would have had a different name and the groups that lived in the Keys would have had a different name. Um, but to just generally answer the question, I think that the people who came to live in the Keys were probably very closely related to, to the Calusa. All right, so we've had a, um, I'll go to a question that has been typed in from Vivian, she'd like to know, is there any evidence of bone tools or ornaments in the keys? Yes, um, I failed to mention that, but there's actually a lot of, of tools made specifically from deer bone and deer metapodia, um, some of their leg and, and ankle bones and things. It's actually a very, very popular tool made across the Everglades and all of South Florida is um, a pointed or wedge tool made from a cut deer bone that was used for um, used for chopping and a number of different tasks. Awesome. And um, so we've had some questions typed in. I see we've got some hand raised hands raised too, but we had some questions that came in as the presentation was going on. So I want to make sure we get to those. Um, Whitney Sands has a, a few questions um, here. So. Whitney, if you'd like to clarify, one of your questions was how are they drilled? So if you can maybe clarify um, that one a little bit more, but another one of Whitney's questions is while we need to get, or I'm sorry, will we need to get permits from the town to dig in our yards? Okay, so I think the first question was in reference to the shells probably and asking okay. how they're drilled. And it just has to be a material that is harder than the shell itself, which in most cases was going to be some kind of stone, even though I said they're rare, they, they were there um, or they, they were imported and they would typically drill the shell from one side or the other or and the other. So they would wind it down from one side and then flip it over and drill it from the other side, which made the process go a little faster. To the, to the second question, um, it is legal to excavate on private property in most places in Florida. That wouldn't be true in St. Augustine and um, in some, some, some other like county lands and in places like that. Um, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily encourage anyone uh, to do so. I would, I would rather encourage people to contact a local archeologist or historian um, for their aid, because you'll be able to glean a lot more information um, if you're working in partnership with, with a professional. Because once you remove items from a site and they've lost their provenience or their location, um, you immediately lose a lot of associated information. And so it's, it's always best to have a professional nearby. 
Okay, so let's go to a raised hand. I have um, Sherry Mather with a hand raised. Sherry, I've unmuted you. Go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Okay, while Sherry is, we're seeing if we can get Sherry unmuted here. I'm unmuted. Okay. Oh, there we go. All right. Hi, Sherry. We can hear you. Hi, Ryan. This is Sherry uh, from Almorada. I have two quick questions. The site yeah. in Almorada that was excavated, how large do you think that site really was? Um, the one in Isla Morada is fairly famous because it was investigated by John Goggin, a very famous Florida archaeologist back in as early as the 1940s. Um, I, I think that site could have been um, and certainly was probably football field um, sized at one time. And that was one of the problems that I was alluding to earlier is the sites have been so heavily impacted that it's almost just haphazard in, in guessing how big they, they could have been. They could have stretch the entire areas of of some of the islands okay um, in that case. thank you yeah and my second question is do you have at this point a public display of your finds in the keys uh or are you eventually going to do something like that yes that's what i i'm sorry that's what i rushed through at the very very end i don't at this time have a public display of my finds but i hope to um, that's what i was talking about at the very end there at the key west custom house I've already spoken with their curator and um, some of the folks there, and we hope to have a permanent display of, of Stock Island materials there as soon as perhaps next year. We're probably on a, on a timetable that's going to be looking at 2021, 2022 for some of these things. But in short, yes, definitely. Um, I, I hope to have those things in place very soon. Nothing yet, but we hope to very soon. All right, thank you, Ryan. Okay, Mary Lou Rubin has a hand raised, and then I've got some more typed questions for you, Ryan, so I'll get to those as well. Uh, but Mary Lou, uh, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, you implied that uh, these natives came down from Georgia because of the materials that were found. So that means they migrated down. Where did they originally migrate? Was it was it across Alaska and, and down? I'm still confused as to where they came from. Sure, there's there's some competing hypotheses of of where folks came from, but most evidence points to they came from Asia across the Bering uh, land bridge, Beringia, into what is now Alaska and filtered down um, into Canada and to what is today the United States. Um, also, people would have used boats and they would have tracked the coastline of the northeast coast of Russia along Beringia, Alaska, and went down um, both the North American, Central American, and South American coast. And that's all of our best archaeological evidence, genetic evidence from human remains, all suggest that um, peoples came from Northeast Asia and and populated the Americas in that way. It does. Does D DNA uh, corroborate that? DNA does corroborate that. It's just very sticky because there are se there are several different hap haplogroups that overlap with. Um, gene pools or signatures that are Native American and others that are closely related, but largely um, in a general and in a major takeaway kind of set, kind of stance, it is supported by the by the DNA evidence, yes, that folks came from from Asia. Thank you. Thank you very much. Absolutely. All right, Ryan, I just um, sent you a question through the chat feature because it has a word that I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce. Um, did that come through? Let me, I'm looking now. Oh, oh I see it. Okay, does sclerochronology use carbon dating? 
No, um, scleral chronology is related to, but different from carbon dating. So what we're doing with the scleral chronology is instead we're looking at chemicals. We're looking at isotopes of, of both oxygen and carbon, which are contained in the mineral of the shell. And oxygen's driven primarily by the water temperature and the salinity of the water. So when we look at a growth layer in a shell and determine its oxygen content, what we're really seeing is a variable that's related to um, the salinity of the water and the temperature of the water. And when we look at carbon, carbon isotopes of the mineral shell, we're looking at a signal that's related to the animal itself because carbon is found in living things. And then all of the living things that get incorporated into the shell, such as the runoff from terrestrial plants, the coral reefs, all living things that have carbon in them can get incorporated into a shell. And so it's not dating per se, it's more learning about the environment that the shell was growing in. Okay, and then another question um, from Mary Jo. She'd like to know, was there any European artifacts found in the midden? Yes, definitely. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't get the chance to mention that there were shipwreck timbers found at the site. We don't have radiocarbon dates for those, but it is possible in the future to determine whether they might be Spanish or British or some later period. Um, we have square cut nails, which are historic period. Again, we don't have dates for those, but um, certainly post-contact. We have pieces of glass. We have amber, which there was an amber trade post-contact between the Calusa area and Key West and Havana, Cuba. And so we do have several hallmarks. And I think that the Stock Island site was used even more intensively after after the Spanish arrived because we have um, a lot of clear hallmarks of occupation that are supported uh, both in the historical record and then we and then we have archaeological evidence of what it's saying in the historical record, which is really cool. Awesome. So um, lots of really great questions being typed in here. One from um, Peter Larson. Do you currently have any excavations planned in Key West? No, there aren't any um, currently planned in Key West. It's actually very difficult to excavate there because most of the island is frankly paved over and probably what's left on Key West is located beneath private residences or in islands um, away from uh, the major development, islands west of Key West. So short answer, no. Um, we do occasionally, um, there, there could be some digs scheduled for the fall and the winter time up north, closer uh, to Key Largo area, but um, that's all tentative at this time based on what's happening with the pandemic. So I could share information um, through the Keys and History Discovery Center when, when the opportunity comes for people to visit a dig in the future, certainly. Awesome, thank you. Um, so a question here from Donna Quincy. What do we know about the religious practices among the Glades culture? Um, we know we know quite a bit from we know quite a bit from Spanish times of of what it was that they were doing. We know that they were incredibly conservative religiously. I didn't get the chance to mention it, but they were some of the few Florida culture groups that continued to practice their own re religion in spite of, of European mission, of Spanish missionization, which was much more successful farther north in Florida and in other areas. Um, we know a little bit with regard to um, their burial practices in terms of I don't have time to go into into incredible detail, but we we know sometimes when they they might be buried in a mound, other times dismembered and placed in boxes. We know that they they venerated lots of um, various animal spirits and things that show up in their iconography. We know that um, they had uh, we know that they did participate in sacrifice uh, to some degree. 
Um, so there is a lot of information from the Spanish historical record um, that is available, and I'd be I'd be happy to talk more about it um, at another time. Awesome. So we've got two more questions here. Well, one from David Godfrey. Given the absence of agriculture, what sorts of vegetation would have been eaten in addition to seafood? Right. So there weren't a whole lot of of plant foods that were available in the Keys. And we think about species that are present today that weren't there back then, like things just as ubiquitous as the coconut palm. But there is heart of palm that was available in, in the sable palm tree, which is, or cabbage palm tree, which is native to Florida. There were the various like grape leaves and, and things like this. We don't actually have um, we and a lot of this we we have in the historical record or um, we have a very sparse archaeological record of plant consumption in the Keys because they frankly don't really preserve very well. Maybe a few seeds here and there. Um, so a lot of it is is speculation um, on terms of what they were eating and what would have been native and edible at that time. Okay, and for our final question this evening, we'll um, wrap up with Sarah's question. She'd like to know what has been your most surprising find from your research in the Keys? Hmm. I, I would say I wouldn't be able to pin it to just one thing, but that um, fact that I alluded to earlier, the, the coolest thing so far has been reading some of the old historical records after Europeans arrived and seeing them writing about lively trade between Key West and Havana, for example, um, things like the amber that I mentioned, and then actually having um, bits of amber showing up in the site um, in association with ceramic remains and, and then finding things that they were hunting, um, that they were writing in the Spanish records, like the, the now extinct Caribbean monk seal, and then finding monk seal bones um, in the midden. So it's really cool when the archeological record supports what was written in the historical record, because um, that isn't always the case. And um, I, I think that's been the coolest thing at the site. Awesome, thank you. So um, I have a couple of notes for everyone before we sign off for the evening. Um, I wanted to remind you all that the conclusion of the spring membership drive is just around the corner. Um, so if you are interested in participating, you've got until June uh, 19th and on June 20th, we will be drawing for our amazing Key West excursion prize live on Facebook. Um, if you are currently a member, you can participate and earn uh, prize entries by um, referring new members or increasing your level of membership. Um, and then if you are enjoying this presentation this evening and you're not a member, I'd love for you to consider a membership as these memberships are critical to the long-term financial sustainability of our organization um, and certainly helps us continue to bring you awesome programs like the one that Ryan has presented tonight. I'd also um, want to remind you all that the lecture has been recorded and we will upload it to our YouTube channel. We'll share it via our Facebook page as well. At the conclusion of our program, you all will be prompted to take a brief survey about your experience with tonight's lecture. We value your feedback and would love for you to take a moment to complete the survey. The survey will also be sent in a follow-up email in case you'd like to complete it at a later time. As Jill mentioned at the start, we do have a new lecture scheduled in July, which if you're on our email list, you'll receive an email for the registering um, on the Monday before that lecture, or your registration links are available on our website, keysdiscovery.com and on our Facebook page. So I hope you all have a great evening and don't forget to tune in to tomorrow's virtual visit with our curator, Brad Bertelli, via Facebook Live at 10 a.m. And then on Friday, our field trip Friday, also on Facebook Live at 10 a.m. Thanks so much and have a great evening.